David, thank you very much, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I really commend David and the center and the authors of the essay. Uh, just to tell my story about the size of the essay, I tried to staple it in, you know, in my office, and the machine broke when I tried to staple So I broke it into three different pieces, and uh, it worked just fine, and, and um, at least it was all on one side of the page, so I didn't have any problems with it. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the essay raises so many interesting issues. It's so important to our profession that we do talk about these issues. Uh, synthesizing the different constituent groups as well as the, the major, the overarching issues. But what I thought was missing a bit in the essay was a reference to the role of the organized bar. And I'd like to talk about that just a little bit because it's my belief that the organized bar has a vital role pl to play in not only synthesizing these issues and, and broadening the reach of the, of the recommendations being made, but um, in providing a platform for, for actual action uh, on some of the recommendations. Uh, historically, we've seen, seen a number of occasions where specifically uh, the American Bar Association has played a significant role. Uh, once was um, in 1906 when legal scholar and later Harvard Dean Roscoe Pound uh, delivered his legendary speech to the ABA, and it was entitled The Causes of Popular Dissatisfaction with the Administration of Justice in 1906, and that propelled a number of substantial reforms uh, to the American justice system. And 70 years later, um, Chief Justice Warren Burger convened in 1976 what he called the Pound Conference, and it was a collaborative effort, but it was, it was led by the American Bar Association, and that conference essentially gave momentum to the alternative dispute resolution movement. So it'd be interesting, and I hope we can look back at, at this conference and one, Deborah, that we're having at Stanford in a couple of weeks on the future of delivery of legal services and say, this kind of discussion uh, has led the way to some fundamental shifts in, in how we do business, how we deliver legal services, how we improve the justice system to, to meet the needs of, of the modern world. Um, also, in reading the essay, there was a number of reference, there were a number of references to the importance of developing that next generation of leadership, both in law firms and corporate law departments and, and through the law schools. Uh, and what I want to offer to you is this ready-made platform. Your state and local bars, your American Bar Association uh, provide incredible opportunities for young lawyers. It's ready-made. Those organizations are there. If you are a young lawyer and you come into the ABA or your state bar, you can be on a committee. You have to work with other people from different backgrounds. You develop a plan for that committee. You're in charge of the execution of the work of that committee. Uh, you have opportunities for public speaking. You write for publication through that bar organization. Um, you work on issue. You certainly develop your skill sets through the, the, the uh, education programs of the bar, but you also get to work on broader justice issues through the bar organization. So, you know, I commend that to especially the, the students and the young lawyers in this room, and I think it needs to be part of this conversation because it's, it's, a, it's a platform that's there and it's a tool uh, that we can use, I think, to great success in the developing the next generation. Of course, you all know the role the ABA plays in the development of the model rules of professional conduct and that we've had that role since 1908 with the original canons of professional ethics. Um, and it's really interesting, I was struck by the parallels between the issues uh, the authors of the essay had and the observations of uh, Judge Norman Vesey, the former Chief Justice of the Delaware Chancery Court, Supreme Court, uh, when he chaired the Ethics 2000 Commission in the year 2000 as they looked to make changes in the model code. And he said that the commission was aware of the substantial and high velocity changes in the legal profession. This is in 2000. He said that such changes were highlighted by increased public scrutiny of lawyers and an awareness of their influential role in the formation and implementation of public policy. He wrote about persistent concerns about lawyer honesty, candor, and civility. And he noted the competitive and technological pressures on the legal profession from outside sources and internal pressures on law firm organizations and management raised by sheer size, specialization, and lawyer mobility. 
and he emphasized the need to enhance public trust and confidence in the legal profession. Do those sound like words that we heard today? And I think we can all agree that perhaps the more things change, the more they stay the same. So my question to all, to myself and to, to all of you is, will we make a difference this time? Will we fundamentally change our model in a way that, that takes us into a different place, a better place, uh, where lawyers as leaders and lawyers as statesmen and stateswomen uh, have take back control of, of our profession and, and lead it in a direction that we can all be uh, proud to say that we're, we're lawyers. There's further symmetry when it comes to the essay's presentation of the three roles of lawyers and the accompanying four ethical obligations, which are comparable to longstanding language from the preamble of the ABA model rules. Uh, the, preamble, the preamble of the model rules focuses on the role of the lawyer as public citizen. And of particular importance, it says, a pub, and I'm quoting now, as a public citizen, a lawyer should seek improvement of the law access to the legal system, the administration of justice, and the quality of service rendered by the legal profession. As a member of the learned profession, a lawyer should cultivate knowledge of the law beyond its use for clients, and it goes on. So these are, these are issues that have been around. Uh, the, lawyer, the, the authors of the essay have done a terrific job of synthesizing, perhaps putting a different framework uh, and, and bringing a focus to the specific role of large law firms and corporate law departments and leading law schools. But some of the fundamental issues have been around, and I think it's our challenge to try to make a difference this time. And one of the ways that, that we can make a fundamental difference, and it's been uh, uh, mentioned several times in the discussions already, is this persistent justice gap. And it's not within my time parameters to outline the extent of the problem, but I think it's fair to say in percentage terms, 80% of our population does not have access to the legal, uh, access to the civil justice system. And we have been about trying to change that through more pro bono work, more support for legal services corporation. Uh, but we haven't, despite those efforts, moved the needle on access to justice. So you have to ask yourself, if we're doing the same thing over and over, and we're not moving the needle, maybe we need to look at these issues in a fundamentally different way. And it was through conversations I had with David Wilkins and Laura Stein and others a couple of years ago that, that led us to ask the Board of Governors of the American Bar Association to put together a commission on the future of legal services to get at this problem and see if we can come up with innovative new approaches to delivery of legal services, to close this justice gap, meet the expectations of the public, and meet the expectations of our clients in a different world that they live in now, one where we all shop differently, we get our news differently, we bank differently. Uh, why should we expect the delivery of legal services to be delivered in the same way that they've always been delivered? And we're so fortunate that uh, Judy Perry Martinez, who's here, who's doing a fellowship here at Harvard uh, this spring, is, uh, has devoted her leadership ability. And uh, Andy Perlman, who was here earlier, is the vice chair of that commission. Uh, David has been an incredible advisor to it and, and, and many others. Uh, we'll have a conference uh, at Stanford at May 2 through 4. And we hope at that time to synthesize what we've learned at a number of state conferences, grassroots meetings across the country. Uh, I think it was Justice Brandeis and Liebman versus New Ice Company. He talked about the states being the laboratories of, of uh, progress uh, for invention, new ways of doing things on social issues, law issues, economic issues. So we're trying to build this process from the ground up and develop new processes, new platforms for the delivery of legal services to try to, to, try to close this justice gap. Uh, and it's, uh, it's vital that we do it because in a, in a very real way, it's the uh, access to legal to, to justice is a rule of law issue. If you look at the uh, World Justice Project's rule of law index and you look at the four universal principles, uh, the second principle deals specifically with access to justice as a fundamental rule of law issue. Unfortunately, on that specific issue, access and affordability of justice, 
the World Justice Project Rule of Law Index puts the United States at 65th among 99 countries on civil justice access, not, not overall on our justice system. I mean, we have transparency, we have uh, due process, but we don't have access. And uh, among North American and European countries, we're 18th out of 24 countries. So there's so much work to do here. And it's, it's a matter of, of taking on this as a rule of law issue. And it's a matter of making sure that we don't lose the public. When you have that kind of disconnect between access to justice and the public that we're dedicated to serve, uh, it can only lead to distrust in the system. Uh, we have these, <laughs> these institutions that we've heard discussion about that are so important, uh, and, and it's important to have the public's confidence in those institutions. And when you have this kind of justice gap, those pillars of, of, of that stability uh, and our system of ordered liberty really put at risk. And so it's our job to, to, to get at that issue. And I think that's where we can see a coalescing of the three major entities and then expand that to, to all lawyers and, and others from, from different uh, practice areas and settings. It's really important that the public see the entire profession as united uh, and committed to professionalism and increasing uh, access, as I said, our very system of ordered liberty depends on public trust. And I, I always like to, to reflect on the words of uh, Judge Learned Hand when he said, uh, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women, and when it dies there, no court, no constitution, no law can save it. And I think we spend a lot of time thinking about technical aspects of what we do, and, and, uh, but we perhaps neglect that part of reaching out to the public and trying to, uh, trying to uh, address the matters of the heart as it relates to our justice system. And I think this program gives us an opportunity to think more broadly, uh, step back from what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, think about the words from uh, Judge Learned Hand, and, and let's see if we can all work together and address those matters of the heart. I think our our system of ordered liberty in our country depends on it. I think public confidence in our justice system depends on it. And I think working together, we can do something about it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Here we are, last panel on an intense day. I am delighted to be here. The paper in this conference seem to me great examples of what can be accomplished through greater collaboration between the bar and the academy. One of the things my paper bio left out is my current position. I have for a year now been serving as the executive director of the Association of American Law Schools, or AALS for short. So what is the AALS? In a word or phrase, it's the Trade Association for Law Schools. Uh, we were founded in 1900 at the urging of the ABA section on legal education with the goal of improving legal education. We have 178 member law schools. Um, there are, by contrast, I think 2004 law schools accredited by the ABA, so you can see we have some standards. Uh, we also serve as the Learned Society for Law Faculty, which means they come together at an annual meeting every January. Who would pick January for your professional meeting? So what's the difference between the AALS and the ABA section on legal education? As I've just mentioned, we're a membership organization. The uh, ABA section, by contrast, accredits law schools and is duly recognized by the Department of Education. And if you are not accredited as a law school, or a university for that matter, your students are not eligible for federal loan money. So pretty serious matter. And in most states, if you are not ABA accredited, you're, uh, you are not uh, eligible uh, to sit for and become a member of the bar. The accreditation process, though, I want to mention as I'm going by, is conducted entirely by the section, not by the ABA, because there's federal law that limits what a trade association can do in terms of accreditation, a topic for another conference. 
So the uh, uh, focus of the ABA section is on getting uh, accredited law schools to meet what we could describe as minimum standards. The AALS, by contrast, is focused on going above the minimum. Our goal is increasing excellence in teaching and scholarship. So we're interested in faculty not only being terrific teachers, but as a source of new ideas, new legal models, new codes, new agencies. Think of something like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, thanks to Liz Warren. So I was delighted in the paper in contrast to a lot of discussion of law schools where there's just broad brush criticism of scholarship as a waste of time, a waste of tuition money, this paper said law schools have an obligation to produce scholarship that will improve the functioning of core legal institutions. And that's right, because if law schools and law faculty and law students are not doing it, who will? There's one Harvard link, since we're here, I'll mention. It turns out we were founded in 1900, and the very first president was James Bradley Thayer, a member of the Harvard faculty and an expert, I had to look it up, on the law of evidence. Okay, what I'm gonna talk about first is the law school pipeline. There's been some mention of it earlier today, and my basic message is the problem is even worse than you think it is. There has been a significant drop in first year enrollment that began in 2011. Between the fall of 2011 and this fall, 85% of the law schools have experienced a significant drop in many cases, but some drop in others in their first year enrollment. 40 of the law schools are down by more than a third. The result is this academic year is the smallest overall enrollment in law school since 1973, when there were 25 fewer approved law schools. Now, because most law schools rely heavily on tuition for revenue, another way of thinking about this is this year, 85% of the law schools are operating in the red. Many are managing only because they are receiving assistance from their host college or university with some justice because for some years the funds often went the other way from more profitable law schools in the past to struggling departments in other parts of the university. Uh, the change is hardest on the, there's about a dozen standalone law schools that are not affiliated with a college or a university. Now I assume there's a silver lining when the students enroll this year graduate, there's probably gonna be a better match between the number of law school graduates coming out and the number of available jobs. Although there's lots of predictions about closing, there have been no closings yet, no sweet briar, if you will. Although the merger we've learned about in the past month of Hamlin and William Mitchell in Minnesota mean there will be one fewer law school. Now, why did I say it's even worse? You've probably heard some of the data. What you may not have heard, and I want to underscore if you, there's only one takeaway, is the drop in the applicant pool is greatest among students with the highest LSAT scores. That group has declined the most. Now, presumably, it's not because they couldn't get jobs or couldn't enroll in a very good law school. It's because they are choosing not to go to law school. Why is that? Why is law no longer seen as a desirable profession? The essay suggests that part of it may be due to the fact, or what they describe as the striking discontent of many young associates. Word has gotten back to the colleges and the universities. The problem of the dropping applicant pool has been compounded, and you've seen this in the media and in many speeches, by the rush to producing what are called practice-ready lawyers. What does that mean? It's never been the goal of the best law schools. Um, it's better, most faculty would say, to aspire to train someone for a lifetime career rather than being able to pass the bar and take a client the first week out of law school. It also ignores the fact that um, uh, not all graduates of law schools 
are going into JD required jobs. A better way of thinking about it is this category that the technical uh, folks have labeled for us JD advantaged. So some of the information about, well, you go to law school, you run up a big debt, and there are no jobs, are limited to so-called JD-required jobs. But JD-advantaged are jobs in which having a JD may advantage you in progressing in your career. Examples might be President of the United States. <laughs> There's also a need to inculcate the skills and values discussed in the essay so they are prepared to serve more than the client interest. And that goal, I submit, is just as important to students who are enrolled in lower ranked law schools, where their graduates often have fewer job options than the graduates of Harvard, so they may feel even greater pressure to cut corners, to go along, and yet are very much in need of the same kind of uh, educational focus and support in having, I love the phrase, professional courage. All right, to close up, I want to talk briefly about uh, four different points of things we might do. First, I think all of us, I mean everybody in this room, I mean the profession and the academy, need to do a better job of conveying the possibility, to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes, of living greatly in the law. I think many of us, I certainly feel that, have had very great career experiences and life experiences because of legal education. But we've done a very poor job of conveying it. That's part of why those very talented students coming out of college and universities today are not even thinking about it. We can do that better, I submit, if we work together. That's why this conference and this paper are a good example of it. I think we need to do some common writing projects beyond the one you've modeled for us. Uh, across my desk last week came a pamphlet on great careers in national security. And it was illustrated discussion and so forth. We used to take it for granted. We can't take it for granted anymore. And we needed better to do a better job of conveying that to prospective law students. Secondly, on this issue of professional courage, the essay focuses on the need to have people better trained in ethics. Well, I agree with that, but how do you do it? We don't have some mechanical way. I don't think a faculty member can stand up there and give someone a black letter course in being an ethical person. So how do you do it? Well, I want to give credit to my colleague Robin West, who has a terrific book out this past year called Teaching Law. Despite the title, it's really not about teaching law. It's about law schools and legal education and the curriculum. And uh, let me just quote a couple of things from her. Law schools have, for the most part, done a very poor job of teaching students to think as rigorously about their ethical duties as they do about legal doctrine. She warns that a curriculum that fails to study competing notions of justice is both dispiriting to students and ultimately to the faculty charge to maintain it. So one of the things we in the academy need to do more of in law school is to teach justice. Now that's a radical idea. Next, I want to talk, uh, pick up on a quote that uh, Deborah Rohde uh, raised as part of her presentation. She mentioned, after all, law students are headed for a range of careers. It's the point I made about the difference between JD required and JD advantage. It's broader than that. A number of students come to us knowing they do not want to practice law. As a former dean, some of my happiest alums when I encountered them never practiced law in a traditional sense went into business, went into politics, went into government, but were very grateful and talked about the importance of their legal education in this other career. But it makes us all step back from the people who preach one solution, an easy solution. All law schools should teach every law student X. No, no, law students are quite different. They're also quite thoughtful about their own futures and we need to give them some room to make those choices for themselves. 
Finally, one very practical suggestion for spreading some of the insights of this paper in this discussion. As I mentioned, the law faculty gather every January, so we're busy talking to David and others and our uh, meeting planners, and we want to see if we can't take these same ideas out, and it's a way to reach a broader group of law schools. They all need to be part of the conversation. Thank you. I was told. Uh, David, I didn't get the memo. I, everybody's got prepared remarks, and I thought we were supposed to summarize all the, anyways. Um, <clears throat> You're good. I'm well, I'm, I, we'll, we'll find out. Um, let me begin by, first of all, thanking you for giving me this opportunity to share this experience with you. I got to tell you, I sat there and read the paper much like a novel and I just kept what's what's and what's next and what's next and it was fascinating and it was tight it was emotional uh, it was substantive and it gave me sort of a renewed sense that you know this is what I remember about the energy that I had about practicing law it also reminded me of the people who I admired. When I think about Oliver Hill, who was Thurgood Marshall's classmate, uh, and Oliver said, you know, uh, Robert, um, <clears throat> Thurgood and I graduated in the same class in 1933. So like, isn't that the year we repealed prohibition? Or and he said, yes. and." Uh, and we finished one and two in the class. I am always reminded by Thurgood that I was two, uh, and it bothers me to this day. <laughs> but the work, their body of work, changed a nation. We are the most gifted problem solvers in the world. If we decide we want to do something, we just have to make up our minds we're going to do it. And that's what this paper told me. Along the way, we lost our way to some extent. I don't think we're off. I, we, just, we need to recalibrate our compass, I guess is another way. And that's what the paper said. We know where we're going, we just have to calibrate. And this idea of innovation, we teach lawyers to innovate in school. Uh, Charles Hamilton Houston taught his students that if they wanted to change the way society viewed the issue of separate but equal, they would have to innovate. And they did. Uh, if we were going to uh, think about our society in ways that our courts have had to deal with social issues today, we, we had to be innovative. If we expect lawyers to innovate in the way in which they present issues, for resolution, then why can't we think the same way about the institutions that train them? Uh, ben, I think you said it. Uh, we have to be willing to experiment and to fail. That is innovation at its core. Is the billable hour so sacred that we can't innovate and think of a, maybe it has to be phased in, but a way of approaching the way in which we value and evaluate legal services for, for monetary payment in a way that is different and challenges conventional thinking 
about reward for, uh, for services and reward. Do we have to um, say to ourselves, as William said, 60, 70, 80 percent of the people in America, for some reason, either through access or financial condition, are unable to get legal services? Do we have to accept that? and say, well, we just don't have enough lawyers and they just don't have enough time. We are missing a critical player here in that discussion, and that's judici the judiciary. Because we ought to be able to solve that problem. Every conflict does not require a lawyer. And every problem doesn't have to be bundled or held together because the law looks at it that way. And pro se litigants are a heck of a lot smarter today than they were 10 years ago. And guess what? Some of them can actually run circles around lawyers. We can help people solve their problems. We should be able to take that number down to something that is a lot more manageable because we're willing to innovate because we're willing to talk to the courts and say, guess what? The rules, the law, the way in which we approach these problems have affected the resolution of conflict in an adverse way to people, and we can do better. We've got alternative dispute resolution mechanisms now. We've got, we, we have the ability to use technology in a way we haven't been able to in the past, combining all of that and presenting that in an orderly fashion, because we are problem solvers, can render much more positive results if we're willing to form an alliance between the academy, between the judiciary, between corporate America, and between law firms. Which leads me to the next point that this paper really, I think, gives great support for. And that is we don't have to decide, we don't have to resolve every issue in the silo of our respective station in the profession. General counsel don't just meet at the AGC to solve the issues that they are concerned about. And the round table of managing partners don't just meet to resolve the issues they're talking about. And the, and the academy doesn't meet just, but we do that repeatedly. We're always meeting together by ourselves. <laughs> but to take an opportunity like this to say, that's enough already. And to say, going forward, there will be a leadership effort to identify ways in which we will collaborate on critical issues related to the, to the needs of the profession to address the services it's required to deliver to the public. in a way that is different than we've done before is a huge step forward and changes the paradigm upon which we understand and appreciate our ability to solve problems. Service. You, you cannot tell me that we should ever give up the mantle of being a citizen lawyer. That's why people want to follow in our footsteps. That's why civil society in, in this country is considered the gold standard around the world. There is no other 
place in society where the three branches of government only have lawyers. They have other people that participate in certain branches of the government, but we're in all three, and nobody is in all three. And that's for a reason. That's because there was an expectation by the founders and by society that we would provide thoughtful, fair, positive leadership for this country, for our nation, for our communities, for our society. And we have a responsibility to make sure that the next generation of lawyers has access to us in a way that they are inspired to do the very best they can to emulate those individuals who we hold up in esteem and as role models. When I was president of the ABA, my initiative was better justice through better juries. Because the jury system is one of the most fundamental corners of our society that represents diversity at its best. And we have to preserve that. And when I looked for leadership, I said, I need a chair of the commission that's going to lead the discussion on the jury system. And I think that maybe the president of the ABA should do it. And they said, well, Robert, well, there are a couple of other people we think could be better at that. I said, who are they? I said, well, you might try Justice O'Connor <laughs> to start. And so I called her office. And I said, I'd like to speak to Justice O'Connor. This is Robert Gray, and I'm president of the ABA. And they said, that's nice. Um, <laughs> give me your number. She'll get back to you in time. And she did. And I went to visit her after she had been properly briefed about the situation. And when I walked into her office, she said, Mr. President. <laughs> I said, Madam Justice. She said, the answer is yes. What else do you want to talk about? How's your golf game? <laughs> she said, great. <laughs> and then she recommended that for the working group, she said, Robert, I'm going to recommend that you get Judith Kay to head the, she understands this issue and has worked very hard at it. And I'd like her to be the, the chair of the working group. I said, um, Absolutely. And I will call her. She said, no, I'll call her. I said, okay, I can see where this is going. Let me tell you something. Leadership in this association is a shared responsibility by all of us. Talent development is a shared responsibility by all of us. And it is women, LGBT community, lawyers of color, all of us are in this together, and if we demonstrate to the rest of society that we understand that, that we will take the best of that talent and promote it and advance it, we send a signal that leadership, that being a wise counselor and understanding the profession as delivering substantive ways in which to resolve critical problems and disputes in this country provides us, I think, with a platform to ensure the preservation of this democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to be here. Um, also, I want to acknowledge my colleague Florencia Labrizzi, who's here with me. And we we're both so excited to come today. And actu actually, we would have loved to have brought our whole legal team. They were so keen to come 
because the topics that you're discussing here today, the topics that are in this essay, these are exactly the kinds of things that at the United Nations that we're talking about, they're, they're presented so much more eloquently than we're able to talk about them at the UN in the, in the essay. So I just wanna say a huge thank you for that and also for, for, for today. And I, I wanted to begin with a, a really brief story about um, uh, idealism and, and, and before um, on the panel, some the people were asked um, who had inspired them. And um, this, this story is actually a story of someone who's inspired me, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. And uh, as you can imagine at the UN, perhaps we're often accused of being idealistic. Uh, so this is what he says. He, he pulls out from his pocket um, the Charter of the United Nations, and he's got, he's got 30 years on me. He's in his 70s, so his is a bit more dog-eared than mine. Mine looks a little bit too fresh, but um, what he says is our responsibility is not to look at the world with rose-colored glasses. We have to be really clear about the challenges that, that exist and really see them for what they are. But at the same time, we also have to have a clear view to the horizon horizon to see how the world should be and then we all have to work so hard to make that a reality and to close that gap and it's worthwhile remembering what it actually says in the Charter of the United Nations it, it starts off we the peoples of the United Nations so it's really speaking about all of us as individuals and I understand at lunch one of the there was I only unfortunately was able to come at lunch but that there was seemed many people were inspired by a comment that was made earlier today about agency and that we're kind of living in a time where everyone is just doing what someone else is, has, has told them to do and no one's really taking responsibility themselves and I think the Charter of the United Nations reminds us that also as individuals we have a responsibility to take action and help close that gap. So there's basically just four elements that I wanted to cover in my remaining time. Um, first, just a few comments, additional comments on the essay. Then I'll speak briefly about some emerging themes from three related international initiatives that we have been working on at the United Nations in the last few years, specifically through the United Nations Global Compact, which is the UN's corporate sustainability uh, initiative. And these are all under the banner, which we've called Lawyers as, as Leaders. These uh, initiatives are both a response to the changing or the evolving role of business in society uh, and of also of the lawyers that advise companies, whether they're inside or outside. Uh, the, they also seek to help drive further change, to turn lawyers into accelerators uh, of issues like corporate sustainability, rather than the breaks that we can sometimes be. And barely a week goes by where we don't have some corporate responsibility person come through our office and rail against their legal team who has crossed out something in one of their documents or told them not to do something, etc. So this was a big motivator for us. We wanted to see why was this the case and how we could engage the legal community, both inside companies but also outside companies, to, to turn this around and to find those great examples of where lawyers already were leading change and being the accelerators and try and get more uh, to join. These initiatives that I will talk about are open to all and we would really, really love to explore how we at the United Nations, particularly in the UN Global Compact, could help support the aims and ideas that are mentioned in this essay uh, through the, the channels that, that, we, that we have available uh, to us. So first of all, on the, on the essay, um, we can really best sum up our perspective in the office by saying that reading it was really a sight for sore eyes. Um, the UN Global Compact, as I mentioned, is the UN's corporate sustainability initiative and we're tasked by the UN General Assembly and have been over the last 15 years with the ambitious agenda of promoting responsible business practices and UN values among the global business community and within the UN itself. So to promote further progress within companies, we and many others have been looking at how to bring greater specificity to what companies should do and can do to become more sustainable. So through country level networks, we work on geographic specificity. Through issue working groups on topics like human rights and anti-corruption, we work on issue specificity. And through a forum with industry associations, we're exploring sectoral specificity. But one of the most recent and promising areas that we're exploring and most relevant for the essay in today's discussion is functional specificity, namely working with different corporate functions to flesh out what their role is and more importantly, what it could become in helping to achieve their organization's sustainability goals. 
So we've expanded beyond those with sustainability in their titles, which as you can imagine, was a big focus for us, probably for our first 13 years of existence. Um, to then look at the role of boards, the Office of General Counsel, procurement officers, compliance officers, diversity inclusion and so on. And I'll come back to General Counsel, what we're doing on that in a moment. Sustainability is a term whose meaning is on the move. For many of us, it's still green in colour. Um, however, as we use it at the UN, it refers to creating long-term value in economic, social, environmental and governance terms. So it's, it's really a quadruple bottom line. I bet you heard of the triple bottom line, but now we've got a quadruple bottom line. So as well as being essential to businesses' own survival, corporate sustainability is businesses' main contribution to sustainable international sustainable development agenda. And while the definition speaks of value creation, implicit it within it is the idea that business should not give with one hand and oh sorry, give with one hand and take with the other. There are opportunities, but there are also responsibilities, and they cannot and should not be offset against each other like people try and do with carbon. Good deeds in one area cannot compensate for causing harm in others. And so we call these two different dimensions respect on the one hand and support on the other. Where respect is not causing harm, taking responsibility for addressing businesses' own impacts on as externalities on society and the environment, and not just focusing on risks to business, but really importantly, also looking at the impacts that businesses uh, can have. And it's the baseline or the minimum that corporate sustainability requires. But support, on the other hand, means additional voluntary action that goes beyond avoiding or addressing harm, whether in core business, strategic social investment, public policy engagement, partnerships, and other forms of collective action. Um, some of you may know that later this year, the international community, community will adopt a set of sustainable development goals after a process set in motion in 2012 to guide international and national action for the next 15 years, succeeding a set of Millennium Development Goals which expire this year. The business community, along with other societal actors, has been really engaged in the consultations as a growing number of companies recognise that businesses are not islands, they are organs of society, and their success depends increasingly on the state of the societies and environments in which they operate. Issues like climate change, growing inequality, mass youth unemployment, skills mismatch, war and conflict, cultures of exclusion and intolerance, etc. These all pose threats, sometimes existential threats, for a growing number of businesses. And as the draft sustainable development goals stand, they include a really strong nod to the importance of the legal framework and rule of law. And they have a whole goal, goal 16, um, that, that looks at these issues that's um, as part of the solution. And among other things, achieving this sustainable development agenda will require unprecedented levels of cooperation, including within companies and across corporate functions and more alignment between corporate goal setting and societal goals. So there's the opportunity to ride the sustainable development and corporate sustainability wave for the kinds of ideas in this, in this essay. So one idea to how to do this would be to use corporate sustainability terminology as an entry point for discussion, linking changes in the general counsel's role to changes in how companies are, are being seen and seeing themselves. Along these same lines, the SA makes a strong moral case based on duties and obligations for lawyers to step up to play a more proactive role. But there's also the complementary opportunity and cost savings dimension that could be given more emphasis. Um, as they say, a stitch in time saves nine, and one general counsel I spoke with likened not adequately investing in the legal function as deferred maintenance on infrastructure. There's a growing number of general counsel who are involved in value creating activities. For example, in-house lawyers and in tech firms in Silicon Valley that do pro bono work in the community help to build their firm's social license to operate and create a more positive relationship in their community. The, the General Council of LexisNexis spearheaded an initiative on business and the rule of law, which also engages customers. And general councils who embrace values-based management and proactively build company culture with high integrity also add value in terms of morale, productivity, employee engagement and loyalty, as well as saving costs for non, um, from non-compliance. And of course, they raise the value of the company in the eyes of customers and, and uh, business partners uh, too. 
So just briefly in the remaining time on these initiatives that I mentioned, the first one is a guide for general counsel and corporate sustainability. And uh, we've been working on this for the last year and a half and it um, involves interviews with dozens of general counsel all around the world. And it will be launched in June of this year and the many of the ideas that have emerged are really, really in line with what's in the, in the essay. So it's, it's so exciting. And just some of the emerging themes I wanted to share from it that many general counsel are seeing their role as trusted advisor expand and that some are really keen for this guidance to help open doors in their company to play such in enlarged roles as trusted advisor but they are concerned about squeezing of resources and and what that might means what that might mean for their role but uh, there is recognition that this may help actually drive collaboration with other departments and they can leverage that to play this role as trusted advisor uh, there's also a great need and interest in capacity building so that they actually have the skills to play these new expanded roles and a strong desire for metrics to drive engagement and measure progress to show that the legal department is an investment and not just a cost. The second one is on business for the rule of law, and this is complementary to the Guide for General Counsel. Um, it's an initiative that seeks to demystify the rule of law for business. And as you can imagine, it's the general counsel often in the company um, who's the first who can kind of wrap their minds around this. And it, it involves, um, we actually sourced about 85 examples around the world of what companies are already doing to help support and strengthen the rule of law and the legal framework where they're operating. And the interesting thing is that while pro bono work is one dimension, strategic social investment, there are also examples in core business, in advocacy and public policy engagement and partnerships and collective action. So I think it's really helpful to think more broadly about the roles that lawyers can play in helping to support the legal framework. Um, pro bono is very, very important, um, but there's also these other key ways. Some of the emerging themes that have come from this are that indeed there are business opportunities in helping to fill rule of law gaps, that necessity is driving initiatives, weak rule of law makes it harder for companies to operate, especially to operate in a sustainable way with integrity. Responsible business wants a more level playing field which entails stronger rule of law. And those who have taken action spoke not about not knowing where to turn to, uh, to identify others to work with uh, in their efforts to support um, the strengthening of the, the legal framework. And the kinds of actions being taken range from promoting social enterprises that provide legal services to people living in poverty at the bottom of corporate supply chains, to provision of technology and know-how to register births or create land title systems, support for training of judges, advocacy for law reform, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, General counsel also want guidance on how to broach the conversation and add value to their organization in this area. They also had a great interest in the Guide for General Counsel as something that would uh, support their efforts. Uh, many lawyers were particularly energised by the discussion and interested to consider the opportunity to support the building of the legal framework. And consistent with the paper, uh, one lawyer, for instance, said it reminded them of why they became a lawyer in the first place. And these uh, consultations, which have been 20 around the world in the last few months, have laid the groundwork for greater cross-functional engagement within their, within their organisations. So then lastly, I wanted to briefly mention on the topic of legal education and um, guided with our special advisor on legal education, Nicole Bigby, he's over there. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, we've been, we basically backed into this topic of legal education because as I mentioned in talking about the Guide for General Counsel and Business for the Rule of Law, we realised that lawyers are calling for and uh, having more skills in these areas to play this trusted advisor role, to play this innovator and create creative role connected with what they could do and contribute to support the, the rule of law. So in that context, we have an existing initiative on business education called PRIME, Principles for Responsible Management Education, with 600 business schools from across the globe who are working on curriculum, integrating into business school curriculum, management curriculum, um, corporate sustainability ideas. So the kinds of ideas that we've been trying to look at are for instance, would law schools be interested to establish their own division in such an initiative? Or would law schools uh, and other providers of legal education um, like to develop a mirror initiative 
like a principled-based initiative that could look at these issues, or is it something else entirely? But whatever it is, I just want to reiterate that the, the UN um, Global Compact um, stands ready to support and collaborate uh, on these fantastic ideas, and just thank you again for, for the essay and the, the opportunity uh, to be here today. And we also look forward to continuing the discussion, including tomorrow, on the next steps, because we're so keen to uh, uh, engage in further action and have more impact. Thank you. Well, again, I think you can see why uh, I was so excited to have these four people to come to conclude the, the formal remarks of the conference, but we still do have time for questions. And John, are you headed to the microphone? Terrific. Thank you very much. And I hope others will follow, because we really do want to continue this conversation. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Sherman. I'm general counsel of SHIFT, which is a nonprofit that is uh, staffed by uh, those who uh, shaped and drafted the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, uh, which have uh, become the global standard for uh, businesses uh, worldwide on the need uh, for companies to respect human rights. Um, and I want to uh, build on uh, the uh, comments of Bill Hubbard and, and Ursula um, with respect to uh, uh, this uh, essay that we're all considering, because um, in, uh, I'm also the uh, chair of the International Bar Association's uh, working group on business and human rights. We are in the process of uh, developing a, a guidance for both bar associations worldwide uh, and um, also uh, business lawyers on the implications of the guiding principles uh, for the practice of law and for bar associations. We have represent, re representatives on our committee of the American Bar Association, the Law Society of England and Wales, uh, the Bar Society of Namibia, the, the, the Japanese Bar Federation, and uh, uh, the Spanish Bar, as well as the Turkish Bar. Um, and we are using um, the uh, essay and the principles in it uh, as a fundamental platform for uh, guiding uh, lawyers in the application of the guiding principles, which have their most, uh, most relevance in the gray areas, in countries, in post-conflict countries, uh, where the rule of law is not well established, but uh, uh, businesses need uh, guidance on what to do. Um, and it is precisely in this area where the concept of the lawyer as wise, wise counselor has its greatest application. So I just wanted to bring this to the attention of the group. This is a real life uh, uh, application of what you guys are writing that we are using uh, with the expectation of uh, having uh, international uh, impact. This, this guidance is going to be approved by the IBA at its, at its uh, conference uh, in uh, Vienna in October. And I credit uh, uh, the three of you for having uh, given us uh, the, the, the legal platform with which we can now say to lawyers, you know, please, you can't just advise on the black letter of the law and, and then stop. You've got to look, uh, you've got to look beyond that and, and provide uh, comments, which is one of the reasons why the American Bar Association endorsed the guiding principles uh, in 2012. So I thank you very much for, for your work in this area. Well, thank you, John. And John has done as much as anybody, as I'm sure Ursula and others would say, to promote these principles uh, with John Ruggie and others, really starting with the Global Compact. And I'm actually uh, privileged that I'll be speaking in Vienna at a plenary session in which we're going to talk about some of these issues. Uh, but please, uh, again, the, the microphone is, is open and that I hope, please, uh, we very much want to encourage all of you to participate. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Burquist. I, I'm not a lawyer. I, I don't even know how I got in here, actually. <laughs> Why did you let me in? But it, it, in the spirit of diversity, I think that it's always useful to take multiple lenses, right? And, it, it's, and, and I think uh, a lot of times the same type of people try to solve problems, and that's actually not diversity. <laughs> and so I come from Silicon Valley, and I think looking at how Silicon Valley solves problems or how an ant 
colony cells. It solves problems. It's very interesting, right? Uh, when ants go out, they don't, uh, they don't direct what happens. They don't create big plans and, and committees. Now, now, there's lots of room for committees and big plans and bold action, but there's actually a lot of room for experimentation, which is part of what the paper is about, right? And I think there's, there's two key themes that keep, keep, uh, keep coming out in this conference. One is that there's uh, somehow along the way we've lost the spark of why people became lawyers. I think a lot of times, uh, mo I think a lot of people become lawyers to make a difference. And somewhere along the way, maybe that spark gets lost. And I wonder if there's not an opportunity to actually solve both the access problems and the spark problems at the same time, which is by flipping the problem upside down. Uh, when you look at how Silicon Valley solves a problem, it's not, it's not through plans, it's not through execution, it's not through strategy. It's through an enormous amount of, of experimentation, not just by a couple firms or people who've been doing it for 30 years. I mean, we're talking about people who, uh, from every, from every uh, role and, and, and lifestyle, that's one thing that's actually very interesting about living in California, living on, on the East Coast as well, is, is in California, a 17-year-old and with, you know, walking around in jeans with holes can get as much respect as anybody. Yeah, on the East Coast, it just doesn't happen as much, right? And so <laughs> the question is, how are we actually, you know, I guess the question is, can we just simply try to create some space for people to do what they probably already want to do? A lot of lawyers have, you know, when you're young and energetic, when you, when you, when you bump into something new, you, when you bump into a problem, you want to solve it. And in a lot of ways, uh, a lot of our structures are actually get set up to, to shut that stuff down, right? Uh, and how are we doing, are we creating space for people to actually start, you know, maybe let them start solving the problem? We can still do our committee approach, but have this whole hive of activity. Like I said, when Silicon Valley solves a problem, uh, there's a bunch of, at first it's a bunch of ants just kind of randomly exploring. But then once food sources are found, that there becomes these enormous columns of ants and the whole, the whole hive gets energized, right? Uh, are we unlocking any of that? And if we did, could we not only solve the access problem, but could we solve the engagement problem all in one elegant swoop? William? Well, thank you for that. Uh, those are good points. Uh, first of all, let me start with where the legal profession is. I think in my remarks I talked about going back to the original canons of ethics in 1908. Uh, those canons were put into place to protect the public, uh, but over time uh, it seems that uh, perhaps they're a barrier to innovation. And as I mentioned in my remarks, there, have been, uh, there, there are companies out there who have decided there's a better way, and, and Modria is one. They, they, they've had, I think, 60 million disputes a year are, are solved online, and um, Deborah Ramirez, we've talked about uh, a project her son is involved in called Justice Serve. It's, uh, there's an algorithm that's been developed that um, allows uh, a, a consumer to go in and, art and, and type out the, the issue and say how much money I have to solve the dispute and an algorithm matches that consumer with a lawyer willing to solve that problem uh, for a specific uh, amount of money. Now, the ABA rules and the model rules and the rules in all 50 states the District of Columbia excluded because they allow non-lawyer ownership. Uh, but law firms are not allowed to have non-lawyer ownership. They're not allowed to have outside investment. Uh, they're not allowed to operate in multidisciplinary practices. Um, Jenner and Block last week, however, opened a subsidiary in London to take advantage of the UK 2007 Reform Act that allows alternative business structures for law firms. But what, we, what we're seeing emerge now is the law firms operating under a specific set of rules that are, that are designed to protect the public, and there's, a, there's much to, good to be said about that. But there's a parallel system that's being developed, an internet-based system, where you have outside investment in technology companies that provide legal services. And that is a burgeoning parallel justice system. Now, Robert mentioned that not every 
problem, to need, every dispute needs a lawyer, and that's true. And you see uh, different, we've talked about the different licensing programs in, in the state of Washington with the LLLTs. Interestingly, on March 23rd, the state of Washington not only said we're going to have limited licensed legal technicians, but they will be allowed to have be owners in law firms. They can have an ownership interest. So I use the, uh, I, I love the, the Carol King and, you know, the plays out now, but when I started thinking about this, it was, you know, that song, I feel the earth move under my feet. <laughs> and, and the earth is moving under our feet. I don't know where it's going. That's one reason we have this Commission on Futures, and Deborah Rohde is going to guide us in a couple of weeks, and, and Judy and, at Stanford as we try to break down some of these silos. And I think Robert was talking about people who meet together and they don't talk to each other. Well, we, we have the innovators and the regulators, the judges, the <laughs> practitioners, the academics all fused in this process to try to come up with a blueprint for the future. It will probably at some point they'll have to address the issue of regulatory reform. Uh, but again, we have to remember whatever we do, the ultimate responsibility is to develop a system that protects the public. What concerns me now is the development of parallel systems where you have technology companies funded by outside investors, some lawyers are involved in them, and, and they're performing a, a, a vital function and people are gravitating to them. Avo is another company. They get 8,000 hits a year on their website and have dispensed legal advice on 6.5 million problems. They own by, they, they're, they're outside investors. Um, so we have, to, we have to eventually reconcile these developments in a way that protects the public and allows for innovation. Venture capitalists in 2012 put $66 million into technology companies that provide legal services. That number jumped to $456 million in 2013. Last year it went over a billion. Uh, this year it's going to be way beyond that. There's no question. One of the projects that we're working on here is a project on disruptive innovation in the market for legal services. It's clearly coming, and uh, it's something that we all need to think about. It's already happening out in the UK. But please. Steve, Hi there. Uh, I'm Sarah Gonski. I'm a 3L here at HLS. Thank and, you, uh, Sarah. I was lucky enough to have Professor Wilkins for my professor last semester in legal and profession. So uh, <laughs> it was fun to hear his perspective last semester on all of these issues. And uh, she's a star. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is, is for all of you, but in particular for Ms. Irene. Um, I heard you speak earlier about kind of pausing that one of the issues facing the legal profession is that it's uh, increasingly difficult for law schools to bring in the amount of applicants that they've brought in in the past, particularly these kind of elite high scoring applicants that they're looking at. Um, and that in consequence, a lot of law schools have had to close um, that sort of thing. Um, I just want to offer up my perspective as a millennial who has very <laughs> recently gone through the process um, in the current economic environment and just ask kind of what role you see the economy playing and the, the huge cost of legal education in that um, kind of the shrinkage of the law firm market. I think from the perspective of a lot of students, we would see that as an extremely positive thing because a lot of reason why our peers would have wanted to go to law school but didn't wasn't because law had a kind of a PR issue where we didn't think it was um, going to be a good life or that it was going to be glamorous. It simply became an economic proposition that people couldn't see the numbers adding up. Um, so it seems like with the oversupply of people coming out of law school and the undersupply of jobs that would actually compensate them in amounts that would enable them to pay off their student debt, that maybe the shrinking of law schools is a little bit of a good thing. I was just wondering to have your perspective a little bit on that. Well, I, I mentioned that there is the silver lining, that is the number of students coming out has reduced quite dramatically in four years. It's closer in line to traditional JD jobs. That's certainly the case. This phenomenon, though, of the biggest drop being among the students with the highest LSAT scores is really a different matter. Now, LSAT is an imperfect measure. I want to put it out there. It, it, but it's a convenient stand-in for a quality issue. And that, I think, poses a bigger challenge, not just for students who might have had a great career in the law, 
Uh, nobody's quite sure where they are. One of the things deans do these days is speculate. One of the favorites is they're in their parents' basement creating the next new app. Um, but I think it's a problem not just for the students, not just for the law schools, but ultimately for the rule of law, since you've put it out there. Because we do need a, a level, a, a sustainable level uh, of lawyer uh, skills and abilities to run the institutions we take for granted in this country. And we're pushy at that level. In short, I think there's been an overreaction. With some cutback, probably good, yes. You have to worry, though, at the size of the reaction and at losing some of the ta most talented students. Uh, we need them to continue to come and innovate to, innovate to pick up uh, uh, the discussion we've just had. Um, it's so important. We need uh, one, one quick short story. I, so I was in. Um, China on behalf of the association, this is now six years ago, they were very interested at the time in connecting with the American law schools. And in the asides, a formal ceremony in the Great Hall of the People, it was quite an amazing moment. Um, in, in the more informal moments, so several of the Chinese educators, and they, by the way, have 600 law schools to our 200, now they're undergraduate said, you know, we, we produce a lot of lawyers here. They've memorized a lot of law. But we notice you Americans do something else. You produce problem solvers. And we want to understand that so we can do it too. So we want to make sure that we continue doing that and attract great talent to doing it because we need it. Thank you. Steve? Uh, my name is Steve Zapp, past president of the American Bar Association. I don't know what you call three past bar associates, whether it's a gaggle of past presidents, <laughs> whatever you call it, but uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be with my good friends up here uh, who have really explained the issue quite well. But I, I want to go back to the lens discussion that was just uh, had a moment ago as one of the ants. Uh, I'd like to discuss that a little more thoroughly. Uh, the fact is that um, uh, without access, and I think William explained it very well, the U.S. is very lacking in access. We're not going to have many more of these meetings because without access, we don't need lawyers. That's the end effect of having no access. I, I'm, uh, recently, I've recently chaired the National Center for Access to Justice for the last two years, and what is discussed here is just the tip of the iceberg. It used to be 80% of poor people did not have access, mostly women and minorities. Today, that's spread all the way through the middle class, and we could ask everyone in this room how many of us can afford ourselves. <laughs> uh, and I, I think there's few of us who can. Uh, the fact is that when Robert said, do we have to accept the 80%, it's a very good question. But we ought to ask the question is, is it up to us to accept it or not? because in the final analysis, it's not up to us. It is up to society to determine whether we still have value to society. It would be very interesting to have a panel of those people who have been denied access in that room there <laughs> and see their solutions to the problem, not our solutions. I kind of got the feeling a little bit of being in the palace with Louis and Marie Antoinette talking to the duchesses and dukes about what the problem is uh, while the people are rioting outside. Uh, the fact is that, and again, it was mentioned just a moment ago, you know, even in Stanford, we have all these groups that we're all going to attend, educators, you know, judges, lawyers, where's the public? Uh, the, the real problem is we need to engage with the public better. And as we talk about, uh, you know, the most important thing is to protect the public. That's why we have ethics and so forth. I'm not sure the public, if they can't have access to courts, think that that's the most important thing. Uh, they want to be protected. But before being protected, they want to be able to have access. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way of providing that access. And part of the solution that's uh, being discussed globally is the deprofessionalization of the practice of law. 
We hear it all the time. ABS is, is one example. Uh, there are lots of examples. Why do we need lawyers? And if we can't answer the question of why the law doesn't provide access at a reasonable price, uh, and there is some other system, then at the end of the day, the answer is, let's, let's start looking at that other system. And if there's one thing that's important to everybody in this room, and I say that without qualification, is that we remain a profession. But we are quickly losing that with justification if we're not, be, uh, if we're not able to provide to the public the access they need. Yes, Dana? I don't think I can talk loud enough without the microphone. Well, except it's being picked up. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I just, so just, Dana, I know who you are, oh, but sorry, they all I'm should. Remus. Um, I'm a professor at the University of North Carolina. Um, I wanted to just draw attention to one theme in your essay that I really appreciated that we haven't spent that much time today talking about directly, but that's come up a lot, and that's the notion that we can focus on both business and service at the same time. I've been struck that we've been talking a lot about how important it is to individually and collectively focus on all of the wonderful aspects of lawyering other than profit and <clears throat> short-term profits. Um, and that's, I think, indisputably important to this goal of fostering lawyers as citizens and as statespeople. But there's a real tension between that and a lot of other things we've been talking about in terms of liberalizing regulation. Because of course, as we liberalize regulation, we are allowing market forces to increase competition. That's a lot of how we're getting at the innovation we need. And those two goals are really in tension. And so as we move forward, I think it's important to grapple with that tension. I think managing the tension is, is a lot of, of where the path ahead lies. Um, as an academic, I'm better at dealing with abstractions than specific uh, <laughs> steps forward. And I think one of the wonderful things about today has been talk of specific steps forward. But I also think about the thing that keeping that tension uh, in mind between laws of business and laws of service and recognizing it as um, two things that are not mutually exclusive but that are hard to manage is important. So I'll just take that as an opportunity to uh, give a thanks to our timekeeper, Nick Robinson, who's more than just a timekeeper. He's actually a brilliant Yale Law School graduate who's been working with us for a year, yeah, for two years in the Center on the Legal Profession and who has written an incredibly thoughtful paper on just the point uh, Dana raises, which is what's the relationship between the uh, liberalization movement and the innovation, as, as Jim said, which is very, very critical to where we are, but also what are some of the downsides of that innovation? And he's been doing some empirical work, and again, it's another plug for doing empirical work in this area, uh, on what has been some of the effects of some of the UK reforms. And I think it's fair to say, he says, it's really been a very, it's a mixed bag. There have been some things that have been uh, provided more access, but there have also been things that have created some kinds of conflicts that I think we ought to be careful of. Not to say we don't want innovation, but that we have to look at these things uh, carefully. But please. Hmm. Hi, my name is Jane Lee. I'm a 3L here at Harvard. Um, so kind of just picking up on the last few questions and then also the comments um, by uh, Ursula and Bill, William. Um, so I, I found it very interesting, this idea that, uh, you know, innovation and market forces and, you know, all of these factors can really uh, change how the profession um, provides services. But I wonder too, like, especially with the access point, how much of that can come from the lawyer of markets and how much of that has to come from um, the government and the judiciary and internal innovation in those in those areas, and you know, the market can't create um, reforms in government because we have government is totally subject to different forces. It's subject to political forces. So um, I wonder, what are some of your ideas in terms of how lawyers can be advocates in the political arena to uh, you know 
really um, inspire the public to get behind these uh, judiciary changes and reforms um, outside of our profession as a service, but also that part of um, access to justice. Thanks. Ursula, do you mind speaking to that first? Um, maybe just one dimension of that. So I mentioned that we have gathered about 85 examples of what different companies are doing around the world to help support um, the rule of law and a number of some of them are many of them actually are from law firms but many of them are also for, from non-law firms but many of them are also about advocacy um, so companies for instance getting together with other companies and maybe calling for better law enforcement for instance around topics that in the absence of that is actually meaning they're having to spend a lot more on social auditing for instance or uh, you know coming together to, to call for changes in the law to be in line with international standards etc so um, that kind of thing, I think, is, a, is an example of how um, lawyers can get involved in advocacy. I think often what we hear, particularly when you're talking about companies, is they don't want to do it on their own because they're worried about how it might be perceived by government in particular. But when they team up with other companies um, or also with employer organisations and others, then that concern um, kind of goes away, that collective action approach and, and in partnership with, with others. So that's just one dimension, but definitely I think that uh, there's already lots of examples of how lawyers are engaging in this kind of advocacy, and there's a big opportunity for more to engage in this way and help um, show also to governments that um, the businesses actually want a level playing field and that it's not that um, all businesses are anti-regulation, etc. cetera, um, particularly if it's in line with international standards, actually they're quite supportive. Yes, please, Barry. Change the subject slightly. I'm Barry White, and a retired lawyer in uh, Boston, and just returned from four years as the U.S. ambassador to Norway. Um, one of the things that strikes me is the cost of the education that the kids coming out of law school face, the debt that they face when they go into into the law firms, and the lack of ability in some cases to go in, into public service and how we compete and what we might be able to do. That you mentioned. Uh, somebody mentioned our uh, senior senator from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, who's working hard on uh, debt issues for students. But I think we've got to look at things in different ways on how we can help students finance their legal education and get them in the public service, forget some, forgive some of their debts, maybe some of the law firms can help. But I really think we have to look at that, as well as looking at why the law firm costs, law school costs have gotten so high. Um, you know, somebody mentioned earlier in our group that it's the competition for law professors with the law firms, and they see what the law firms are paying people. But it's got, I think it's gotten a little bit out of hand. I don't know whether that affects the, uh, the, the, who applies to law school anymore. But, you know, I know that I have a son who's a second year uh, at a large law firm in New York. Fortunately, he didn't have, go into debt, but a lot of the people in there are in debt and are there mainly to pay that debt off. Judy, do you want to speak uh, to that? A couple of quick thoughts. Uh, first, uh, law school is extremely expensive. It's true. It is a problem. I would put it in context, though, and say it's a problem for higher education. So then we have to ask more broadly, why is that? And it is in part because we still rely on individual small groups as a key part of education. And it's not something that you can easily do through computerized instruction. We're going to see some blended instruction, but there, there are reason the costs have gotten so high. There's some good news, but really worrisome news on the total cost side, though. At the moment, the federal government's loan program is actually quite good. You can limit that debt, and today most debt is federal debt, uh, to a proportion of your income, which gives people an opportunity to make choices they couldn't have afforded 10 or 15 years ago. And indeed, there's a quite good program of public service loan forgiveness in place after 10 years. It is under enormous uh, challenge right now. Uh, from both the administration and the Congress. This is one in which the ABA and the AALS have teamed up. We've got a working group on it. Uh, it's very difficult because no one's sympathetic about giving anything to lawyers. But when we talk about, we're, we're, we're talking about legal services lawyers, people who are serving clients in need. So I hope people in this room will pay attention as, as efforts are made to not just cap but eliminate loan forgiveness for the people who are doing great service for this country. Thank you. Paul? Thank you. Uh, I 
just want to say. Just to introduce uh, yourself. I'm Paul Lippi. Um, uh, thank you guys for doing this and just maybe offer just a tiny bit of perspective, which is many people, probably the majority of people in this room, are very passionate about all these issues. Some of us might describe things slightly differently. But I think because we're all passionate, we've been thinking about it a long time. And so with that, there's a sense of frustration of, golly, you know, we're, or we're not where we want to be. I, I want to just offer kind of a glass half full perspective. I think that to have this meeting, to have the head of the ABA so engaged, to have so many people from so many constituencies, uh, many, many things are changing. The law, the law model of change, the constitutional convention model of change that's formal, consensual, and simultaneous, that's not how these kind of changes happen. And so I think we can be optimistic that in so many places, in so many ways, the things we want to see happening are happening. Most of us perhaps would want to see them happen quicker. I think the fact that Harvard is stepping in to convene this kind of meeting is, is indicative that it will happen quicker and indeed is happening. So I, uh, I will assert my opportunity to thank David and uh, half the audience. And, <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Paul. I guess I, I will assert my opportunity to thank the people for, without whom this conference could never have been done, and that is the terrific team at the Center on the Legal Profession. You've seen them all, uh, making sure everything is working exactly on time. It's Nathan Cleveland, who's standing in the back of the room. Chandra Craven is over here. Uh, Derek Davis, uh, there he is over there. He's still checking on logistics. Hakeem Lakhtar is checking on dinner. Nick Robinson was checking on time all the time. and. Brian Fong, uh, this uh, group of people really uh, did an absolutely amazing job. And if you had any doubt about it, ask anybody how the Mitt Romney event went when we were gone, which was a disaster. So uh, please thank my incredible team. Uh, what <laughs> happened? <laughs> You know, I, I, I also want to thank all of you who have given your most precious resource to be with us today, and that is your time. It's the only thing you can't get any more of. And your honesty and your openness here. It really, I think, for speaking for Ben and Bill, that it's really been a, a joy for us to sit and listen uh, to the incredible dialogue that's gone on here. I mean, I, I think uh, we all know we're at an important moment in so many different ways in this profession. Uh, I often say that lawyers face what I called in an article a few years ago, the paradox of professional distinctiveness. I was hoping this would catch on and be put on bumper stickers and <laughs> sell, uh, for, uh, but it hasn't worked so far. But I think you get the basic idea. On the one hand, Lawyers feel tremendous pressure to be more like businesses, to be more like their clients. They live in an incredibly global, complex, competitive environment. And quite frankly, we've seen the results, whether at the top of the profession or for ordinary practitioners of people who haven't figured out how to adapt to these changing market realities. We have to be honest about that. And yet, I think as Steve Zach just said most recently, but many of you said, if we are only just another business, then why in the world should we have any kind of distinctiveness? And why in the world, Judy, would the best and the brightest uh, want to come join us unless we have the connection to the important issues that William and Robert and Ursula and so many other people spoke about here. Those issues of justice and equity and fairness and the rule of law and individual liberty and justice and all the reasons why we all came to law school and why we still attract terrific people to come to law school, but we have to be able to say to the young people, and I'm so delighted to see the students in the room, and I hope you will take the time, those of you who are no longer students, to meet them and to talk with them because they are our future. But we have to have a compelling argument for them about why the same kinds of opportunities that we've had in this profession, and many of us spoke a lot about those opportunities, will be available to them. 
and even more so how they can improve on those opportunities to make the profession and the world even better than the perfect world that we have left them, which is, as we all know, far from perfect. Uh, I think that all of us have a role to play, including uh, great law schools like this. Uh, I'm very honored that we can play this kind of convening role. Uh, I hope that you will stay engaged with us, uh, that you will check out our website, that you will look at our digital magazine, The Practice. As I said, there are things you could pick up to find out more uh, about it, that you'll find ways to communicate and to be connected with us uh, in the future, because that's the only way we're going to solve these problems, is by each of us contributing in our own way, whether it's doing research or advocacy on the ground or running great organizations uh, or being the best lawyers that we could be or the best uh, people engaged with lawyers we could be. That's the way we're going to make progress on these issues. Um, we still have more of this great conference and I hope you will all be joining us. We have a cocktail reception which is back in the room where we had lunch and then we will have a terrific keynote address by Judge Rakoff, one of the most thoughtful uh, people thinking about these issues today. At a double bonus he will be introduced by his brother Todd Rakoff who's promised to tell a few stories about him so you don't want to miss that. Um, and then we will for anyone who's still here tomorrow morning uh, ben and Bill and I will be uh, around. We have a, just a very informal continental breakfast for anybody who wants to come and talk about next steps. But for anybody who does have to leave us today uh, at this point, I just want to please express my thanks to all the panelists and all the participants uh, who have made this really a very special day. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>